climate change is driving historic droughts across the globe, and parched regions are increasingly turning to cloud seeding, a weather modification technology for boosting rain and snowfall. At least eight U.S. states and more than 50 countries have some kind of cloud seeding program. China alone spent more than $1.3 billion on seeding clouds between 2012 and 2017. Yet, cloud seeding has always been scientifically iffy. It supported failed military weather weapons, it spurred accusations of rain theft, and there's never been much solid proof that it even works. Now, new research is bringing us closer to understanding the process and exactly how effective it really is. But can this weather-bending tech ever fully dispel its cloud of controversy? Cloud seeding is just another arrow in the quiver. It's uh, another tool that we can use in the whole portfolio of of the water system and our portfolio of power generation. That's Derek Blestrid. He's a senior atmospheric scientist at Idaho Power, an electrical utility with a growing cloud seeding program. So why is an electric company messing around with Idaho's clouds? One word, hydropower. By having a little bit more water available to us, that's the cheapest um, energy source that we have on that helps to keep our costs low our hydro facilities can offset our need for other generation sources like gas or coal. Like much of the American West, Idaho is experiencing severe record-breaking drought. And with less water around, hydropower is feeling the heat. U.S. hydro generation is expected to have declined around 14% this year, and at least one California facility had to shut down completely. And usually, that means burning more fossil fuels to fill the gap. So here in Idaho, what we do is wintertime seeding, so we're trying to enhance the, the snowpack that falls in the higher elevations of the mountains. Idaho Power's program specifically focuses on trying to make it snow. But in arid desert regions, summer cumulus clouds are seeded to increase liquid rainfall. And in some cases, cloud seeding is used to break up large hailstones and storms before they fall. So this snow falls down and then it's a reservoir in the mountains. And so People can recreate with it, they can snowmobile, they can ski. That water then trickles into the streams, which is good for for plants, it's good for the fish that's there. Cloud seeding usually involves getting a compound called silver iodide into clouds. You can get it there with smoke or vapor, by spraying from an airplane or blasting it off the ground. Inside the clouds, the silver iodide gloms onto tiny hovering water particles. Those particles might never have fallen to the ground, but the seeding material gets them heavy enough that gravity can pull them down. The silver iodide specifically acts on droplets of supercooled liquid water. They're below freezing temperature and yet stubbornly refuse to ice up. When we were in school, we all learned that the freezing point's 32 degrees Fahrenheit, right? But in nature, that's not necessarily the truth. Um, in a clean environment like the atmosphere, Water can be in the liquid state, in theory, down as cold as minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And so what that liquid water needs is it needs something to teach it how to freeze. And so that could be another ice particle, that could be a dust particle, that could be, you know, an, an aerosol that's floating in the atmosphere. We inject silver iodide into the cloud, and silver iodide on the molecular scale is hexagonal in shape, so it's mimicking a a natural ice crystal. And when that then comes in contact with the supercooled liquid water, it basically flash freezes it and it starts the process of the snowflake. Sounds plausible. And yet, until a few years ago, no one had actually observed this process taking place inside a cloud. Outside a lab, scientists were simply unable to prove that cloud seeding worked. The elements of cloud seeding as we know it were discovered by scientist Vincent Schaefer and Bernard Vonnegut in the 40s. Schaefer's first tests involved forming a cloud in a box, creating snowfall in a repurposed home freezer. In 1947, he reportedly flew the first successful cloud seeding run in upstate New York, making it snow with a bag of dry ice. This was before silver iodide became the aerosol of choice. Of course, in the US, 
We weren't about to let a new technology go unweaponized. During the Vietnam War, Operation Popeye was a years-long U.S. military cloud seeding project. The idea was to lengthen the monsoon season, with floods and clogged roads to hinder the enemy's movements. The operation was largely considered a failure, and in 1977, using weather modification as a weapon was banned by a UN treaty. But the weather modification experiments continued. Project Storm Fury, a 20-year project that ended in the early 80s, aimed at weakening the impact of hurricanes using the principles of cloud seeding. This project was also a failure, but it taught us a lot about tropical cyclones. In this 1966 Storm Fury footage, you can see Joanne Simpson, a pioneer in cloud modeling and the first woman in the United States to receive a PhD in meteorology. As time went on, studies began to cast doubt on whether seeding was really doing anything at all. Cloud seeding's reputation was on thin ice. Governments began to wonder why they were spending millions on these programs. It was basically oversold because everyone went out and said, okay, we can produce precipitation no matter what, and we can solve trout conditions. So um, without really a lot of scientific basis. And then 10, 10, 20 years later, people realized, you know, it is actually not that easy to do. And we are not really getting the precipitation that we, we were hoping for. Katya Friedrich is a professor of atmospheric and oceanic sciences at the University of Colorado. She studies storms. And her research has been key to finally pinpointing exactly how effective wintertime cloud seeding can be. Why has this topic been so controversial um, in the scientific community? The underlying principle is relatively easy, straightforward forward, and works very well in the lab. The problem in the atmosphere is twofold. First of all, the atmosphere is not a lab. You have a lot of turbulence, you have a lot of motions. The second problem we have is that we're doing cloud seeding in active precipitating systems. It's really difficult to distinguish what is a natural process and what is a cloud seeding process. Without a way to test exactly what a cloud would have done without seeding, how can you tell what you've added? Over the last two decades though, new technology has allowed scientists to closely monitor conditions inside clouds and storms. Statistical, numerical, and computer-based modeling improved as data was gathered year after year, building better information to test against. And in 2017, Katya, with other scientists and seeders like Idaho Power, was able to precisely observe and measure every step of the cloud seeding process for the first time. They found the long sought after evidence that winter cloud seeding works, at least to some extent. We could really track the entire life cycle of, of this process. We could even evaluate how much snow we produced during those cloud seeding events because we basically eliminated the natural precipitation. After finding storms with supercooled liquid water but almost no natural precipitation, the team knew most of the snow came from seeding. When conditions were perfect, the precipitation formed in neat lines, echoing the precise movements of the seeding aircraft. Once we saw these lines that, that generally, they looked like zigzag lines, we thought, okay, this is nothing that, that, a, uh, that nature can produce. But again, we were not quite sure, but then we thought this was pretty exciting. When we are able to produce that once, can we produce that again? The experiments only produced very light dustings of snow, but over an 80 square kilometer area, it added up. Between three successful runs, they produced 282 Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of water. Do you think we can say unequivocally that cloud seeding works? Yeah, I mean, it does work. I mean, there are certainly conditions where it works better than other conditions. We also showed how much um, precipitation you can actually get out of cloud seeding. And it is not that much, but again, it comes down to how desperate are we for water. So again, if we are in a, in a trout situation, if we are in a very um, arid environment, then cloud seeding is a valuable tool. So cloud seeding will not solve trout conditions or trout um, problems, will not solve the, uh, the, the lack of water in many, many regions, but it can contribute to, um, to solving the water issue. But the debate over cloud seeding goes beyond the question of whether it works. One question that I sometimes get, get is like whether we are stealing water. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, the principal underlying answer is yes. There's no way to know for sure whether a seeded cloud would have later precipitated in a neighboring area. 
This has led to accusations of rain theft in places like China, Australia, and the western U.S. Sure, some seeded clouds would have rained or snowed somewhere else. Of course, that somewhere else could be over the ocean. It's also not clear that cloud seeding results in any measurable loss of moisture for downwind areas. Water systems are connected in ways that, in the long run, can make fighting over clouds pointless. And honestly, does anyone really own any particular cloud? Even if we are stealing water from the downstream states, these states might also benefit by the water that is then again being stored in, in, the, in the Rocky Mountains. So it's not really an issue that Colorado does the cloud seeding and stores the water. No, this is actually water that actually goes into the Colorado River and then serves all the downstream states and actually Mexico. In order to solve the trout problem and the, the water problem, this has to be something that has to be done collectively, not just by a state. This has to be done by the entire uh, Western United States. It's not about stealing one from the other. And are there any sort of environmental harms of silver iodide? I'm just imagining that sort of becoming runoff and getting into kind of water systems. Are there any known sort of risk to this? You're putting silver iodide into the cloud, the silver iodide will end up in the groundwater. But the way we are currently doing this, or the way it's currently done, is that the amounts of silver that are found in the river streams are um, basically very really low and they're low any kind of EPA values. All of these agencies that currently do cloud seeding, they also have to provide documentation about what is the, the level of silver in, in river streams. Okay, so it sounds like it's a little bit of a question mark still, like what the kind of risks are, at least to human human health. We're below EPA levels in waterways, but we're not totally sure what this could do to me. Yeah, again, there's also a lot of research on different methods where you don't have to put in silver iodide, where you can maybe do this with electric fields and things like that. And so maybe we solve the problem of silver iodide. Scientists have experimented with replacing silver iodide with sea salt, propane, and even bacteria. The United Arab Emirates is reportedly developing a system that would use drones to zap clouds with electricity. Created with scientists at the UK's University of Reading, the technology isn't operational yet. But the idea is that jolts of power would fuse small, cloud-borne droplets into larger ones, which would then become heavy enough that they fall as rain. It's the kind of high-tech weather-altering project we'll probably see more of as climate change heats up which is kind of ironic when you think about it. Forced to alter the weather by the very same weather we ourselves have horribly altered. People can get really upset about cloud seeding and they say, oh, you're manipulating the weather, you're manipulating everything. And I said, you know what? Every time you get into a car, every time you get into an airplane, you are manipulating the weather as, as well. And we don't think about this. Even with the evidence gathered by Katya and other researchers, a lot of questions remain about cloud seeding and how well it works under different conditions, leaving the technology's future still very much up in the air. I think sometimes it can be oversold. Again, you see how much we struggle with even quantifying how much we can produce. I'm really suspicious if the, if people are trying to claim this as something, you know, we, that we know and then we can really control. I'm not really sure we can really control the weather. <laughs>